Welcome to Grace Community Church's virtual Sunday service. We're so honored that you're here. We hope that everything's going really well in your life. And if you're looking for a place for encouragement and support and love, you came to the right channel. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to come before you this morning to have your word presented to us. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, help us to receive the blessings, the instruction, and the encouragement that is part of your message to us. So Lord, we commit our time to you. We ask that you be with us, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Whether we can help with a rummage sale or give to a church or give to individuals who need, we pray that you'll help us to understand that this is what you say in the scriptures. It is more blessed to give than receive. There really is a secret about this. It's counterintuitive because we think it's getting, it's hoarding, it's keeping stuff. We think that that's how we do better. But in reality, it's sharing. It's being willing to have the open hand. Scriptures talk about this all over from the Old into the New Testament about being generous and that God, God shares and blesses the generous man, the generous woman, because that's the way God is. And we can never equal your giving because you gave your very life. And that's what we're here to celebrate today, communion, where we are to remember you. Why? Because it all came from that one selfless act where Jesus Christ laid down his life on the cross for our sins. Help us as we continue the, the lesson in giving. Uh, all of our lives long, we have to learn to be givers. And then in eternity, I suppose, we'll enjoy the benefit of all the giving that we did, because then's when the rewards will be handed out. And probably a lot of us will wish we had done a lot more. Help us to start that practice now about sharing and giving and being sacrificial. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank the Lord for Christina's 
leading us in worship, no matter what's going on. We're going to look today at the next in the series of um, looking at the Nicene Creed. And in the Nicene Creed, it is a statement of faith early, early, one of the earliest statements of faith by the Christian church before there was any denominations. There were no Baptists, no Lutherans, no, there wasn't even any Catholics. It was still just one church. And I found something interesting when I looked at the Nicene Creed. I found that it was written to correct heresies that were beginning to develop inside of the church because teachers were coming in and, and um, confusing Christians about who Jesus is, who God is, who the Sp Holy Spirit is and what he does. And um, the Nicene Creed gives a, a more expansive kind of a statement. And what we're going to do with this is at the end of this series, I'm going to have for you a handout that will have every single Bible reference on the creed so that you can look up when it says, we believe in God our Father, maker of heaven and earth. It'll have in parentheses next to all of those statements, all of the Bible verses that support that. So that's, I have an individual in church that's working to do that. So I'll have all of that for you at the end of this series. Because it's Communion Sunday today, I decided to go to the part in Jesus Christ's statements about Jesus Christ to where it talks about he was crucified under Pontius Pilate for us. So let's get that up on the screen and take out your sermon notes and let's pray first. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that we, your church, have been given truth and that truth is something that we as Christians need to hold to. There's so much compromise, so much uh, falling away, so much turning away from the true doctrines of the scriptures revealed to your people. Help us to stay true, even though we see all around us many who have turned away, including ourselves, where we have found ourselves compromising, maybe doubting what you are saying in the scriptures. Help us to hear what you say, to believe it, and to live on it. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the Nicene Creed, which the reason it's called the Nicene, because this council of, of church scholars happened in a place called Nicaea, which was in ancient um, Eastern Roman Empire. It was under where Constantine the Great was, and uh, Christianity had been legalized. And uh, the Apostles' Creed had already been written, but it was really more uh, succinct. So they expanded more about Jesus' nature because there were these teachers who were coming in and they were attacking the nature of Jesus. So that's why it says in the Nicene Creed, we believe in Jesus that he is begotten, not made, the only begotten of the Father. So we'll cover that in our look at Jesus Christ. So because it's communion, we're going to go to halfway in the statements about Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at this part that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate for our sake. So let's read this together. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So the Nicene Creed gives us a lot more detail about who Jesus is. Now, you're real familiar with this if you've been in any kind of Christian background, uh, because many churches repeat this statement every time they meet, or they used to anyway. And the reason churches have gotten off point is because they've stopped believing these things. So we're going to look at something here about Jesus Christ. We're going to look at the Gospel of John with a couple other references to Matthew. And um, we're going to look at this being crucified under Pontius Pilate, okay? Jesus was tried and convicted by Jewish and Gentile authorities. I'm saying it that way because anti-Semitism, which has grown up in uh, the world again, it's raised its ugly head again in history. It's getting bad again all across. Even our, uh, our academic uh, institutions are having riots and anti-Jewish sentiment. It's called, that's called anti-Semitism because the Jewish people are sons of Shem. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the three sons of Noah. Abraham is from the line of Shem, and Shem are the Shemites. So anti-Semitism is what we call prejudice against Jewish people. Now, this prejudice against Jewish people is historical. It's nothing new. It happened way back in ancient history with the Egyptian government saying, there's too many Jews, let's throw them in the Nile. All of the boys get thrown in the Nile. It was anti-Semitism. 
has always happened. And it's raising again in our day and in our age because of a misunderstanding of what God has done and is doing through the Jewish people and uh, when Jesus Christ finally returns. So I made the statement here that Jesus was tried and convicted not just by Jews. The Jews were in, Jesus was a, a Jew. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are believing in a Jewish Messiah. Now, if you believe in a Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, then you are understanding that when I say here, because a lot of the historical anti-Semitism in human history has been, they killed Jesus, okay? That's why we treat them bad. Well, that's, that's wrong because it wasn't just the Jewish authority structure that had Jesus put to death. It was Gentile, and that word Gentile in the Bible means everybody, that, everybody outside of the Jewish people. So that means Egyptians, Babylonians, Romans, Greeks, English, German, etc., etc. Gentile means everybody else. So Jesus was put to death by Jewish authority and by non-Jewish authorities. It's not just the Jews who put Jesus to death. And if you as a Christian understand what the scriptures teach about this, you'll understand this. Jesus had to die, and he had to die the way he died, and it's nobody's fault. Because God said in the book of Acts, chapter 2, through Peter the Apostle, that he was handed over by the foreknowledge of God. God used human history to get Jesus to the place of crucifixion and death and burial and resurrection because it was the only way to save human beings from their sin. So it's nobody's fault. It's God's plan, okay? You need to really grasp this because the... When I've said this, we put this on YouTube, ask Brent. We put this on YouTube. And I got a whole bunch of, because of the growth of anti-Semitism in human culture, I got a bunch of comments from people uh, in the Middle East. And they were angry because they're saying, you're a Zionist and you're this and you're that. And I go, look, because I said this in one of our short clips, called, they're called shorts in YouTube. And it's like a little two minute video. And I said, the rise of anti-Semitism and an attack on the Jewish people is actually an attack on Christianity. Because if you believe in Christianity, you believe in a Jewish Messiah. So an attack on the Jews is really, an, it's called a flanking movement. You attack the Jews, but what you're really doing is attacking Christendom. What are they attacking? That what God did through Jesus Christ isn't legitimate. That we don't need this. That we need to get away from this. We need to destroy this. So let's destroy the Jews. Let's destroy Christianity. Then we'll all be happy. I'm here to tell you that's never going to happen. There are promises and guarantees in the scriptures about Jesus Christ's return and about God's commitment to salvation through Jesus Christ and the establishment of God's kingdom coming to us by Jesus Christ. And hopefully this sermon will help you a little bit in that. So when I say Jesus was tried and convicted by Jewish and Gentile authorities, you need to include yourself in this. Have you ever studied this, that when artists or sculptors do any kind of a depiction of the crucifixion of Christ, they often include themselves in it? Mel Gibson, Rembrandt, Michelangelo. They include themselves because they realize that he was put to death because of my sin. So you'll see in Rembrandt's painting, that famous painting of Jesus being raised up on the cross and the nail, you, it's Rembrandt, and the nail was Mel Gibson, I'm sorry, where they show the, the hammer hitting the, the nail. That's Mel Gibson's hands because he wanted to identify with this. He was put to death because of my sin, right? We need to get an amen on this. It wasn't Jews, it wasn't Gentiles, it was me. It was my sin that put him on the cross. You guys get this? And God did this because this is the only way to deal with your failures as a human being. It's not by going to church. It's not by praying more, being more religious, being a nicer person, giving more. Yes, all of those are good things, but they're not enough. You need what Jesus did for you when he died on the cross. Why? Why that? When, remember Jesus Christ? This is for our benefit, not for his. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. There was no other way. 
It was the only way to save the souls of men and women, women through the thousands of years of human history. There is no other way. It's not by more religion. It's not by more social change. It's not by you turning over a new leaf. It's the only way for your eternal soul to be dealt with in front of an eternal God. So let's look. In John 18, the Jewish leadership led Jesus from Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest at that time when Jesus was alive on earth. Caiaphas was the high priest of the Jewish people. Something that we don't understand because we don't live in that time. The high priest was like uh, the mosaic equivalent of the prime minister, okay? He was in charge of the religious and political life of the Jewish people. So Caiaphas was the high priest, and they led Jesus from there to the palace of the Roman governor. Who's the Roman governor? Well, Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor is not like our governors, where we have an election every four years and we vote in a governor or vo vote out a governor. The Roman governors were placed into power by Rome, by Caesar and the Senate in Rome. It wasn't an election, it was an appointment. This man was appointed by Rome to be in charge of that area called Palestine. It was early in the morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jewish leadership did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. What is this? What this is, is the Jewish people, by their religious law, were not allowed by the law of Moses to contaminate themselves by exposure to Gentile uh, environment, so they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover. So they tried to keep themselves religiously pure so that they could do Passover, okay? That's what this is really all about. So we don't, un we don't really uh, identify with this because most of us are like, whoopee, no big deal. But they were really serious about their religion. Watch this. So Pilate came out to them and asked, look how committed they were to their religious convictions. They were so committed to it that even though they wanted to deal with this in front of a Roman authority, they wouldn't compromise what they believed to be religiously pure. They didn't compromise. They could have said, wow, we want this done, so let's go in there and talk to Pilate, and then we won't be able to do our religion. They wouldn't compromise their faith. I think a lot of us should do this. We, we should be much more committed to, I believe this, and no matter what anyone says, this is what I believe. And even though the culture and the government and the authorities and even my family, even though it's against what God says, I am going to plant my feet on this Bible and I'm going to believe it. And I'm not going to let anyone shake me off of this. I've seen husbands and wives. Um, I'll, I've seen a wife shake a guy off of the faith or I've seen vice versa. I've seen grandparents or parents shake people off the faith because they say, no, we don't believe that way. So you can't follow God. Don't let anyone tell you what to believe between you and God, because the belief between you and God is personal. You and what you believe between God is between you and God and the scriptures, no one else. It's none of my business as a preacher. It's not the church's business. Your soul is your soul, and you dealt with your sin with your Savior, not with me, but with the Savior. So let's look. Pilate came out to them. So he actually did acquiesce to their request. He, they wouldn't go into him, so he came out to them. So they, they didn't compromise their faith. They made the Roman authority come out to them. What charges are you bringing against this man? So he's a Roman authority. And by the way, his authority is backed up by Roman armies. They have soldiers with swords and everything. So he's, he's got authority by force. They replied, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. So we here see Jewish authorities and Gentile authorities. Non-Jewish people and Jewish people all came together to get Jesus Christ tried and convicted. So I'm, I put this in here because of the growth of anti-Semitism and this anti-Jewish sentiment that keeps on growing all around the culture because of a misunderstanding of what God did through the Jewish people to bring salvation to us. The Jewish people, it says in Romans, have experienced a hardening until Jesus comes back, until the full number of non-Jews come into faith, the Jewish people, for the most part, not all Jews, but many, many Jews don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. But at the end of time, they will all believe Jesus is the Messiah because God has promised this. So Jesus had to be convicted under Roman authority. So that's your fill in Roman, because only they use crucifixion to execute condemned criminals. 
Crucifixion is described in detail in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is about 600 years before Jesus was actually crucified. And when Isaiah wrote this as one of the prophets of God, crucifixion was not being used anywhere. Nobody was using this as a way to execute criminals. This happened later on when the Romans came into power and they used crucifixion to execute criminals. If you've ever watched this old movie called Spartacus, they, I think they did a remake of it as well, but the older movie's better. Spartacus was a slave, and he got all of the other slaves in the Roman Empire because, I don't know if you guys know this, but they didn't have a really nice, yeah, the Roman Empire was huge and it was powerful, but it wasn't really nice to be a individual little human being in the Roman Empire because something like 80% of the general population was under some form of slavery. So Spartacus got all of the slaves to rebel against authority, and they almost succeeded in overthrowing Roman authority, but the Romans pretty much put it down. And what they did with all of the leaders, including Spartacus, is they crucified them from Rome all the way down the main avenue, all the way out the city. So when you're walking into the city, you would be walking for miles and miles and seeing all these guys hanging on crosses. They were known for crucifixion. Jesus being crucified by Romans was nothing new. They did this by, that's how they established their authority. If you guys don't do what we say, this is what's going to happen to you. So everybody, that's why when you read about Pilate put a sign on top of Jesus and the sign always had the crime. And so he claimed to be king of the Jews. And if you were a criminal, like the other two guys, they were thieves or this guy murdered somebody or this guy, um, did this, they would crucify you and put the sign above your head so that everybody looked and like, I guess I better not do that. <laughs> I know that we don't think that way in our culture anymore at all, right? We wouldn't have any Walmart, people running out of Walmart with shopping carts full of stuff. It wouldn't be happening anymore if we were back in those days because they crucified you for doing that stuff. Oh, we can't do that. That's too cruel. Well, I know, I know, but I'm just telling you historically, that's how they dealt with crime. And the reason crime is so rampant in our culture today is because we refuse to punish people. I, I refuse to steal. Even if somebody gives me, I'm at a store and they give me extra. One time I was at a bank and I, I, got, I wanted to get $100 and I think they gave me $180 and I go, what? It's the, the error was from the clerk. And I, I went back and I said, hey, you gave me too much. I, I just, my conscience won't let me do that. I don't think it's worth that my conscience being bugged about, I took $80 that wasn't mine. A lot of people think like, all right, extra $80, yay, free. It's not free. It wasn't my money. It was stealing. That's the way I was raised. Sorry, it's just the way I was raised. I can't steal. So I think our whole culture should get to that mentality. Scriptures say in Proverbs that, um, don't give me too much so I don't get arrogant. Don't, don't give me too little so I don't become a criminal. In other words, be content with what you have. Instead of, I want more, I'll, since I want more, I'll just steal it. That mentality will lead you down a really bad road. So trust God, work hard, ask God to bless you. He will. He will bless you. Take them yourselves, Pilate said. Judge them by your own law. The Jewish law to condemn criminals it was stoning them to death. Remember when Jesus was on alive before this, before the, the trials? They picked up stones to stone him, and he asked them, why do you want to stone me? Because you, a mere man, claim to be the Son of God. So their way of, of uh, execution was stoning people to death. But Jesus had to die like this, because the, Isaiah the prophet says it, Jesus said it. He had to die by, cru by crucifixion. We have no right to execute anyone, the Jewish leaders objected. What does this mean? When the Romans came in and they, they beat up your army and they took over your country, the first thing they did is they said, we're in charge now. You're going to speak our language and nobody can put anybody to death, only us. So that's what they would do. So the Jewish leadership, they wanted Jesus dead, but they couldn't do it legally. So they had to go to the Romans. So John puts in parentheses this. I'm sorry, I should have gone ahead to the, to the verse. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Who wrote that? John. Who was John? One of the Jewish disciples of Jesus Christ. 
He, when he writes the Gospel of John, he's a little bit older. He's maybe in his 60s or 70s. He writes this down. He goes, this is what I experienced. If you read the other Gospels, it says that John stayed with Jesus all the way until they put him in the grave. He watched him die on the cross. I saw them stick a spear in his side. John's the one that saw all of that. So in retrospect, he's writing and he says, why did Jesus have to die by crucifixion? Because that was an awful way to die. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken, well, when did Jesus speak these words? When he was here on earth, it says in the Gospels, all four Gospels say he told the disciples, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem. He will be arrested. He will be flogged. He will be beaten. He will be mocked. He will be spat upon. They'll pull out his beard and they'll crucify him. And then he'll be buried. And on the third day, he'll rise again. He taught them that since before he went to Jerusalem. So John remembered that and he goes, why did this have to happen? Because it's the only way. Watch this. Jesus' response to temporal powers should be our example. I put this in here because we're into another election season. And in Christendom, I've seen way too much like uproar about elections. And you're a Christian. If you're a follower of God and Jesus Christ and the Bible, you need to understand this. Temporal powers are just that. You know what the word temporal means? We get our word temporary from it. All authorities are temporary in, in comparison to what? In comparison to eternity, in comparison to the kingdom of God, they're all temporary. Republicans, Democrats, Greens, Independents, Communists, Marxists, uh, uh, all Political expressions throughout history, they come, they go, they rise, they fall. What's the person who follows God supposed to do? Look to Jesus as your example. So here's the example. Jesus stood before the governor who questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer then Pilate said to him, didn't you hear? Don't you hear how many things they testify against you? But he did not answer them regarding even a single charge so that the governor was quite amazed. So what's the example of Jesus here? Here it is. In Peter, you can write this down, 1 Peter. It, I don't know the verse, but it's in 1 Peter, maybe chapter 1 or 2. I think it's 1. Peter said this, Jesus Christ like a sheep before the, shear, the shearers is, was silent. He didn't have any guile in his mouth. He didn't curse them back. He didn't malign anybody. He entrusted himself to the Father. He wasn't worried about what the Romans do, what my Jewish culture does, what the high priest does, what this guy does. He didn't have enmity in his mind. I'm going to get even with these guys. Just wait till I get my throne. I'm going to get even with all you guys. He's not that way. He doesn't think that way. He's silent. Why? He's looking to a way longer, if you will, fruit. He's not looking to a temporal authority. He's looking to eternal things. He's looking to the kingdom of God that's coming that we're all going to live in, where we won't have any more elections. Yay! <laughs> we won't have any more corrupt politicians. We won't have any more weird social policies because God will be running the whole thing and everybody will be content with that. Because we will have lived human history and we'll have said, I don't want to go back to that ever. I like living with God. God's in charge. Yay, let's just live here and be happy. You say, that sounds really simplistic. It's not. That's what the whole battle in human history is all about. Do you want God in charge of everything or not? If you want God in charge, submit to God, listen to what he says, follow him. If you don't want God in charge and you think that man should be in charge, okay, you're going to get what we have now. Fighting, wars, bombs, let's invent something new to kill people with. That's what we do. That's what our whole human history has been all about. We've just gotten more technical about how we do it, right? Just more and more fancy ways to kill people. So Jesus is our example. He was quiet. He entrusted himself to God. He didn't worry about answering the charges. Say, I don't know if I could do that. Well, ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord, Lord, help me to be like you would be in this situation. If you've got a bad marriage, Lord, help me to be what I should be in this marriage. If you've got a, a bad work environment, Lord, I don't like this work environment. My boss is a jerk. The Bible actually says something. Do not curse the man or the woman in authority over you, lest God hear. 
So we need to be Christian in the way we live our lives, no matter what our situation is. Maybe you don't like your background, your culture, your town, your politics. That's not the issue. The issue is, can you live for Christ in all of that? Can you stay faithful to Christ and God in the midst of what you're going through? Or are you going to complain and bellyache and, God, why are you doing this? Why are you do If you live that way, you're always going to be angry. You're always going to be mad. Maybe that's why Jesus says when he talks about the, the eternal kingdom, he goes, on the outside there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That means those who don't go into eternity with him. Why weeping? They'll know that they rejected God. Gnashing of teeth is eternal anger. In, in eternal separation from God, the souls that never go into the kingdom of God, they'll be eternally angry at God. That's no way to live. I love being happy. I love life. I love enjoying life. I love interacting with God and God's people and God's creation. And I want to continue with that forever because that's what life is. Everyone hears about Jesus through someone else. Think about this. How did you hear about Jesus Christ? Maybe you heard about Jesus through a church. Most of us hear about Jesus through a family member, right? A mom, a dad, a grandparent, maybe somebody that you worked with. I know somebody who was raised by atheists, so she didn't get to hear about Jesus through them because they didn't believe in Jesus, so she heard about Jesus through someone else. Pilate heard about Jesus. Who did he hear about Jesus through? Watch this. Pilate entered the judgment hall and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Meaning, how'd you hear about me, Pilate? Who told you about me? I'm going to show you where he, get this, where he got this from. Jesus, well, don't forget who Jesus is. He is the Lord. He is God who became man. He knows all things. How would he know that Pilate's wife had actually sent him a little letter? Watch this, back in Matthew. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a little note. Hey, Pilate, have nothing to do with that righteous man, that being Jesus. Last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. He heard about Jesus through his wife. His wife sent him a little note. So guys, she's not dreaming about you. <laughs> She's dreaming about Jesus, sorry. <laughs> and guys, there's another lesson here. Listen to your wife. <laughs> I mean, this, and so this little side plot going on in the crucifixion of Jesus is to show you that all of us have to face Jesus Christ in some way. Your family, whatever your marriage is like, whatever your career is like. Here's Pilate, he's the Roman governor, and all of a sudden he's faced with dealing with Jesus Christ. One day you will deal with Jesus Christ. Maybe you can walk out of this church and have nothing to do with it evermore on this life until you die. But eventually you're going to have to face Jesus Christ. You're going to have to deal with Jesus Christ. Because today, at least, you heard about Jesus Christ here in this church. Maybe there's a lot of churches that don't want to preach about who he is and what he is. I just read a, somebody sent me an email about the fact that Zondervan, who used to publish the NIV Bible, was bought by HarperCollins, who's another publishing house, and they're changing the Bible. They're changing it. They're dropping out scripture passages that talk about Jesus being the only way. And so I'm like, wow, we're going to have to really start being careful about which Bible we recommend to people because they're changing the Bible. That's an attack on the information that you need to know to save your soul. So Pilate heard about Jesus through his wife because his wife had a dream about Jesus Christ. Why did he, she have a dream about Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jesus Christ gives his life for you. When somebody in your family is reacting to Jesus Christ, you need to listen to that. Why is God moving in that person's life? Why is God making that person get serious about the Bible and Jesus and going to that kind of church? Why? Because God's working in their heart. God's working in Pilate's life. As a matter of fact, think this through for a minute. Read between the lines. What's between the lines here? How is it that we, 2,000 years later, get to have a little peek into the private life of Pilate and his wife? We get a little kind of insight, a little note was passed from his wife to her husband in his career, in his duty, while he's dealing with Jesus Christ. Because most commentators think that 
at least Pilate's wife became a Christian and she shared this information with the church. She said, hey, when, when Jesus was in front of my husband, I sent him a note and I told him this. How would, any, how would anyone know this, right? So Pilate heard about Jesus Christ through his wife. How about you? The kingdom of the Lord is not of this world. I want the kingdom of the Lord, thy kingdom come. Remember that in the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, when's that going to happen? Some churches in, in church history for the past 2,000 years thought that it was going to happen by me being a Christian and you being a Christian. Let's get everybody to be a Christian and then we'll, we'll bring the kingdom of God that way. It doesn't happen like that. Jesus taught about the end of the world this way. When the Son of Man returns, will he find anyone who believes anymore? For when the Son of Man returns, it will be like the days of Noah. Well, what were the days of Noah like? One man, his three sons, their three wives, and his wife. Of all of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that were alive before the flood came, only one man and his three sons and their wives and his wife. That was it. There, that's all that was left of all of the people that should have been following God. That's the way it's going to be at the end of time. The world wouldn't be Christianized. The world will turn its back on Jesus, on the Bible, on the church. Why? Because pressure, political and social pressure, will be applied to them, and they'll be pressured to turn away from Christianity, pressured to turn away from God. So Pilate says, am I a Jew? Pilate answered, it's your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What have you done? Here you are in front of me. I'm a Roman authority. You're a Jew. Your leadership is Jewish. What is it that made them get you in front of me? And Jesus said this, my kingdom is not of this world. It's, it's not from this world. That's why I made the fill in that. The kingdom of the Lord is not of this world. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. It's not independent. It's not green. It's not Marxist. It's not Islamic. It's not Buddhist. It's not go on and on and on. My kingdom, the kingdom of God, is not of this world. So what are we to do? If it were, he said, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by, by the Jewish leaders. But for now, my kingdom is from another place. Okay. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what you're praying? You're asking the Lord to establish his authority on earth. Well, he will one day. He'll finally establish the kingdom of God and all of this fighting and infighting and backstabbing will be gone. But until then, my kingdom is from another place. I'm going to show you something here. Jesus speaking to the disciples after Judas had already left to sell him out. He's telling them this. I no longer call you servants, these are his disciples, because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father I have been made known to you. So Jesus is saying this, his followers are not servants. They are in a different way, but they're not the ones that are going to fight for him. He actually doesn't need you to fight for the kingdom. Did you know that? Look at this. One of Jesus' companions, when he's getting arrested, reached out for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. This was Peter. We find out in the other Gospels it was Peter. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. All who draw the sword will die by the sword. Meaning, if that's the way you think you're going to solve the world's problems by force and by having a bigger bomb or a bigger sword than everybody else, guess what you're going to learn? It's going to come to you too. You know, what, the way you treat others is the way you're going to get treated, right? So if you use violence and force to subject other people around you in any relationship, in your family, in your friendships, at your work environment, if that's the way you do a relationship, guess what's going to happen to you? The same thing. The way you treat others is the way you're going to get treated. And it's not karma. It's a Christian teaching. Jesus taught this. The way you treat other people is the way you will be treated. That's why he told the disciples, love each other the way I loved you. And if you love each other the way I love you, the whole world will know you're really Christians. So be different. Be willing to be like God and Jesus. Now, now, now watch what he says here. I underlined this for you. Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? So which servants is he talking about that would fight for him? The angels. He doesn't need us puny little human beings with our little pop guns. <laughs> angels. I'll tell you a story. 
back in the book of, I think it's Samuel, Second Samuel, David the king, um, no, 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 this is a different, a different story, let me think. It's when one of the prophets was, um, uh, Jerusalem was surrounded, okay, by an enemy, and they were starving to death. And God sent an angel out. It says in the scriptures, God sent an angel out, one, one angel. And it says this, he stood from earth to heaven. That's how big he was. One angel slew 250,000 fully armed soldiers all by himself, one angel. Uh, the Bible says that there are uncountable numbers of angels. He doesn't need us to fight. When he comes back and the Bible says, when he reappears to establish the kingdom, he comes on his white horse and all of the armies of heaven behind him. He doesn't need you to even do anything. He just comes and by his power, he establishes his kingdom. That's coming. Read Thessalonians, read Revelation about this. It talks about it. You don't need to kill people or cut off their heads or shoot at them. You don't need to do that. He will take care of it all. But how would the scriptures be fulfilled that says it must happen this way. Which way? Getting arrested, getting beaten, getting crucified, getting spat upon, laughed at, mocked. It has to happen this way. It's the only way, people. Jesus is teaching this. He's teaching it by word and by example. The truth of God can never be found in temporal worldly systems. If you think that you're going to find God by going to the football game or the baseball game or the concert or the, or the, the art show or anything else that the world puts on for display, you're not going to find him there. You're going to find him with people who believe in him. You're going to find him at that little Bible study. Let me tell you, when I was, see, I, moved, I became a Christian when I was 18. I, ex I accepted Christ into my heart. And all kinds of things happened to me. But anyway, I went back to my home village, uh, Row, where I live now. And there was only, even now, there's only 200 people there. I started going to a Bible study because there was no other place for me to go. I was a, a teenager. I was a 19-year-old. People say, well, you got to go find a youth group. Guess what? I, I went to a Bible study with two guys. One was 80 and one was 75. And I went to that Bible study for a long time. And I learned way more from them than I did from all my friends. Because when I went to my friends groups, let's get high, let's get drunk, let's do this, that's what we did, okay? I hung around with people who loved the Lord. I've done that all my life. How about you? If you get around me, if you want to be friends with me, guess what? You got to come to church, got to come to Bible study, because that's where you'll ask my kids, ask them that. I always told them that since they're all adults now. I'm pointing to one of them. He's back here. Uh, he's already 20. How old are you going to be on the fifth, Micah? 25. Okay, he's our youngest. He's 25. I've always told them, if you want to see your dad, you got to go to where he's at, okay? <laughs> Bible studies, preaching, teaching. Are they sick and tired of me? They're not. They're not. That's the way my whole life has been. If you want to listen to the truth, you're going to find it in God's people. Watch this. You are a king, then, Pilate said. You are a king. And Jesus answered, you are right. I am a king, in fact. For this reason, I was born. I became incarnate. We believe in him, that he became incarnate. He became flesh and dwelt amongst us. For this reason, I came into this world to testify to the truth. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. So help me God. Only Jesus Christ has done this perfectly. No one else. What truth is he telling us? You need what I'm bringing to you. You need my crucifixion. You need to put your faith in me. Everyone on the side of truth listens to my religion, my culture, my politics. No, to me. Jesus Christ is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's it. We believe in Jesus. That's it. No one else, nothing else. We believe in Jesus Christ. If you want to have the truth of Jesus Christ, that's who you need to follow. And if you follow people who follow Jesus and this and Jesus and that, you'll find out that Jesus becomes secondary. Jesus has to stay primary in the group called disciples. If not, then it's not Jesus anymore. Like Paul told the Galatians, I fear that you have believed in some other Jesus. So Pilate says, here's cynicism. You, we think it's something new. Like we think, oh, there's so many religions. And Pilate does the same thing. What's truth? 
Everybody says they know the truth, Socrates, Plato, the Romans, the Jews, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Babylonians. So he's cynical. What's truth? Nothing new. This is 2,000 years ago. Same thing. Nowadays, people say the same thing. Oh, I don't know what to believe. There's so many churches. That's not the issue. We're not asking you to believe in a church. We're asking you to believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. That's who we're, what we're asking you to believe. Grace Community Church, Pastor Jimmy Sandoval, I can't save myself. I went to Jesus because he saved me. And all I'm doing is telling other people this. He saved me. I think he can save you too. Follow him. Don't follow me. Read this about the apostles. They say this. It says they fell down in front of Paul and Peter and others. And they would all say, don't, don't. Not me. Not me. I don't save. I can't heal. He's the one that does it. Not me. And that's the difference between a true follower of Christ and one that's a faker. Because if somebody wants the glory for themselves, then you right away know they're not following Christ. Because a true follower of Christ will always defer to Christ. John the Baptist said, he must become greater, I must become less. That's the way we should always have. All of us should have this attitude. I don't know how lo much longer I'm going to be able to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm a senior citizen now, okay? Pretty soon I'm not going to... I don't know how many more years before... I look at my 85-year-old mom and I go, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it at 80. Maybe if I'm like Claude, I can do it. I don't know. He's, he's 90. He's 90 and he's here. I don't know if he could preach a sermon, but anyway. By the way, he escaped Auschwitz. Did you guys know that? They took his mom and his whole family went to Auschwitz. And the, 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 the neighbors hid him and his brother in a farmhouse so that he could escape being shipped to Auschwitz and being burned alive in an oven. Do you guys know that? Living proof. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. I talked to him. This doesn't rise to capital punishment, guys. I don't want to do this. Nope. I'm not going to kill him. Why? Because the unbelieving world, the non-Christian world, the atheist agnostic world, they prefer criminals over Savior. They prefer anything and anyone over God and Jesus Christ. So John 18, look what it says. It is your custom for me, a Roman authority, to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shot it back, no! Not him, not Jesus. We don't want him. Give us the criminal. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. That's the kind of Messiah we want. One who raises a sword. One who, who rebels against authority. One who leads us into war. That's what we want. And by the way, the Jewish people, after Jesus died at 33 AD, most people think it's around 33 AD, by 70 AD, in 40 more years, 37 more years, the whole Jewish culture followed the kinds of people that Barabbas was. And guess what happened? They lost. They lost the war. The Romans beat them. If you visit modern day Israel, you can go to a place called Masada. You know what Masada is? A mountaintop like, like uh, what's the name of ours? Akama. You ever heard of Akama? It's a pueblo on top of a bluff. Masada was kind of like that. So the last Jewish remnant went up to the top of this bluff to defend themselves against the Roman army. So guess what the Roman army did? They got everybody that they had just beaten up. They made them into slaves. And they says, get some dirt over there, put it over here. Get some dirt over there, put it over here. They made a ramp all the way up to the top of this bluff. It took them, how many years? Does anyone know? I think it was like 50 years or some crazy thing like that. 20 years to build this ramp. They get up there and everybody's dead. They had all committed suicide. So they did follow Barabbas. Now, we are the same. We would rather follow this guy or that guy or this gal or that gal or this politics or that politics and it all gets us dead. I'm asking you to follow Jesus Christ because he gives you life. He gives you forgiveness. He gives you a new purpose. He gives you way more than you could ever find in any human system. Follow Christ. You'll never be disappointed with that. Who are you going to vote for this November? I don't know. I'm not going to vote for anybody. <laughs> yeah, but the bad guy will win. They're all bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. Worldly, I know that there's a lot of real strong opinions about this one way or the other. I understand that. But I decided that I'm not going to get involved with it anymore just because it's so divisive. 
between Christians. I've seen Christians fight. I'm not going to go to church with you anymore because you voted for that guy. It's like, forget it. I vote for Jesus, okay? <laughs> going to hang around with me? I vote for Jesus. Well, he's not running for office. Yes, he is. <laughs> Worldly authorities mock and scorn the Lord Jesus Christ. They make fun of this. They make fun of us Christians saying that the kingdom of God is coming, that he's coming again. They make fun of this. They laugh at this. Yeah, yeah, you Christians, that's all you talk about because it's going to happen, that's why. It's going to happen. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again. It says in the other gospels that they struck him on the head with a staff again and again driving down the crown of thorns onto his brow. And they hail king of the Jews, they said. It was a mockery. It was a making fun of him. You say you're a king, ha ha, boom. Look, I am bringing him out to you, said Pilate. Pilate came out and said to them, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. So Pilate's thinking, okay, these guys want to see this guy punished. Okay, I'll punish him and then I'll bring him out in front of them and maybe that will satiate them and they'll be happy and they'll go home. It's worse. Watch what happens. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, you had to read the rest of the gospels to see where he got the purple robe. Pilate tried to get rid of Jesus by sending him over to King Herod. And King Herod put a purple robe on him and made fun of him and sent him back to Pilate. And it says that they became friends after that. Pilate said to them, here is the man. It's a real famous statement in Latin. I can't say the Latin. Does anyone know Latin? Ect, ect homo something. Here is the man. Here he is. He's got a crown of thorns. He's bleeding. He's beaten. Here he is. You've seen the movies, you've seen the artwork. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they didn't say, okay, that's good enough. Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate answered, you take him, you crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge. I don't want to do this, no. My wife told me no. He's trying to say, the Jews insisted, we have a law and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. And if you read the other gospels, it says this, when Pilate heard this, he was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because maybe he is who he says he is. And if he is, I don't want to be responsible for the one who did this. But we have this in the creeds, crucified under Pontius Pilate. That guy's name is famous because of what he allowed to happen to Jesus Christ. He claimed to be the son of God. And their law, the Jewish law, said that no one could claim to be God's only son. Remember the Nicene Creed? We go back to it. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only son of God. I'm going to expand on that next week for you. What does this mean, the only son of God? In the rest of the, the statement, it says this. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified under Pontius Pilate for our sins, the only begotten Son of God. I'm going to talk about that with you because the Nicene Creed was written by the church fathers in order to counteract the heresies that were development, developing over the identity of Jesus Christ. You need to understand that when we say the only Son of God, you must believe in the Jesus Christ pointed out to you in the scriptures, the ones that have been corrupted, the scriptures, the Bible. The Bible tells you who Jesus is. Will you believe in him or will you not? Paul the Apostle said to the Galatian churches, that's outside of Greece, I am afraid that you believe in some other Jesus. There's only one Jesus, one Son of God. It's not the Baptist Jesus, the Lutheran Jesus, the Catholic Jesus, the Greek Orthodox Jesus. The, I mean, I could go on and on talking about all the denominations, the Pentecostal one, the Assemblies of God one, the this one, the that one. It's the one Jesus. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Let's take communion together. I'd like to ask elders or deacons or even deaconesses, if there's not any here, any elders or deacons, come on up or we're going to do communion. Let me see. Do we have... Do we have elders and deacons and deaconesses? Let's have the deaconesses help too. Come on up, John. Why not? Let's see. Which deaconesses do we have? Kristen? We have Kristen. Huh? Is there another one? My wife, she doesn't like to go up front. She, she, she does not like the front stage. Okay. Oh, God. Uh, uh, Becky, we've got Becky. Becky, come on up. All right. You guys know, need to understand that 
we we're not we don't use titles like here's Holy Deacon, Holy Deacon Dale, <laughs> kiss my ring. <laughs> we're all sinners. We call the word deacon not only means servant. That's all it means. I'm a pastor. I'm not Holy Jimmy Pastor. It's not that at all. I'm just another Christian who's trying to follow Jesus Christ. I only follow him because I believe he forgives sin. I'm not holier than anyone else. He made me holy because he died on the cross for me. That's why. So let's pray as we receive communion. How we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. We pray that as we take this communion, which you told us is to remember you by, that we would turn to you in faith, not to a church, not to a religion, not to a political system, not to a power structure, not to my wife or my husband, but that we turn to you and that we believe in you because you died for our sins. You are our Lord. You gave your life for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's eat and drink together. One time, uh, a couple came in and left the church because I, I asked a woman to pray. Isn't that weird? Um, did you guys know that the scriptures say that all of us are ministers to the Lord? All of us? Male, female, young, old, brown, white, yellow, green, or a Roswell alien, whatever you are. If you're saved, you're a minister. The Bible calls you a royal priesthood. Let's stand together. And let's read this last scripture together. I received... I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Sorry. In my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Since I had my retinal surgery, I, th I see things all weird anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We follow you. You are our Savior. We don't even follow each other. We encourage each other. We minister to each other. We follow you. You're our Savior. You're the shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. And we look to you and we thank you that that's the way you are. You're not a thief, a criminal, a violent man. You're lowly, you're meek. Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for I am meek and lowly in spirit, and you will find rest for your soul. So we're asking you, if you're here today visiting, we're not asking you to follow Grace Community Church. We're asking you to follow your Savior. You want to do that? You can do that with us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for being a part of this Sunday's virtual service at Grace Community Church. You are our family. We pray that your week is very blessed. We hope you like this video and that you share it with your friends and family. Click like, subscribe, and we can't wait to see you again. Thank you.